well, again, let me kick this off on time. Uh, thanks so much to uh, over 150 who have registered to be with us today. Um, your participation uh, in this webinar uh, just encourages us to do more of these uh, and fight through the COVID uh, era and continue to connect and support uh, as is our Air Force mission uh, to always, always advocate and educate uh, in a framework for dominant air and space forces and support for airmen and space professionals and their families. So again, thank you for everyone that's on the mat and for essentially joining the fight today. As uh, you know, I'm your host, Orville Wright, and your president of your Air Force Association, and our guest today, Lieutenant General Jim Hawk, the 16th Air Force Commander, and Chief Master Sergeant Summer Leifer, our 16th Air Force Command Chief Master Sergeant. We're excited and we still look forward to hearing the both of you. Now, the first, um, my job and I do the this for not thanking, and I sincerely thanking incredible sponsors for making this event possible today. I'll start with Collins Aerospace. Uh, these are in alphabetical order, by the way. Collins Aerospace, Elbit America, General Dynamics, GE Aviation, L3 Harris, Lockheed Martin, Next Era Energy, Oracle, Pratt & Whitney, the Pentagon Federal Credit Union, the Roosevelt Group, and SAIC. Again, Tim and Summer, welcome. Uh, over to you uh, for about the next uh, 30 minutes or so, and then we'd like to leave time from about uh, 11.30, or the decent time, by the way, from about 11.30 to 11.45 for Q&A. And today includes a, a wide range of Air Force Association field leadership, uh, our media, and of course our industry, your industry. So again, General Hawk, thanks so much. General Wright, thank you. Uh, Chief Leifer and I are honored to be here today. Uh, th this is an exciting event for us because we're, we're, we're proud to represent our airmen and, and the work that our incredible airmen, our, our enlisted officers and civilians do every day uh, to defend our nation. And, and we're proud of them and, and we continue to learn from them every single day. And so areas that I just uh, wanted to first orient everybody to uh, was what we were asked to do when we stood up 16th Air Force. And it was really to create a new organization to address a problem that had been identified, which is that we had some incredible capabilities in our Air Force to do ISR, cyber, electronic warfare, and IO, but we were not integrating them effectively uh, in terms of how we could produce outcomes for our nation. That was the problem statement that the Secretary asked us to address, and, and in doing so, she assigned us a series of missions. And, and how we integrate those missions is really how we're going to be evaluated. Uh, and in terms of the outcomes we're able to achieve. But those missions that she's assigned us uh, span a whole spectrum of things within the information warfare portfolio. Uh, and I'll just walk through those really quickly to orient everyone. And, and then as we go into the question and answer, welcome any uh, deeper dive in any of these areas. But 16th Air Force has been designated the service cryptologic component for our Air Force and now also for our Space Force. So in that role, we, we represent uh, General Noxoni as the director of the National Security Agency as his component and ensuring that we're conducting SIGINT operations consistent with our laws, policies, and values uh, every single day across our enterprise for both uh, the Air Force and the Space Force. Uh, at other missions that were assigned, we're the AF and Ops Commander. So we run the Air Force networks and we defend the Air Force networks through our 688 Cyberspace Wing. And that is our Nipper, Sipper, as well as our JWICS networks are all operated uh, by 688 uh, airmen. We are also assigned as a component to US Cyber Command and four other combatant commands. And in, in that role, we are the, the comma four uh, for all the Air Force assigned forces uh, to US Cyber Command, but also designated as the Joint Force Headquarters Cyber, which is the planning lead for a series of missions that General Noxoni has assigned uh, to us, but in that role, we are also designated as the cyber component to U.S. Space Command, U.S. European Command, U.S. Transcom, um, as well as U.S. Strategic Command. So in there, there's a really great opportunity for synergy across uh, those roles and missions. We were also identified as a defense intelligence component head, which gives us the responsibility to ensure intelligence oversight of all intelligence functions uh, that fall outside of, of signals intelligence. And those are things we take incredibly seriously in terms of ensuring that every single day we're compliant with our laws, policies, and values in how we execute those functions. Last role that was assigned 
is as 16th Air Force Commander, we're a, a component numbered Air Force. So we present forces for all of, of the, the wings that we have assigned uh, to air components and combatant commands. And those span really our global intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance force, our recce aircraft, as well as our operations to extend networks through warfighter communications, our global weather activities, as well as uh, targeting for all of our air components and combatant commands. So inside of all of those roles and missions, there's really some things that are a nexus. And, and that's really where we're, we're working together across our staff to be able to be effective in integration. And how we integrate is through a, a fundamental set of, of doctrine that we're building, which is around the idea of convergence and convergence in the information environment. Uh, when we started to look at, at the, how we were gonna address the problem, my discussions with General Holmes as the commander of ACC, who's our parent headquarters and responsible for the organized, train, equip of all of our roles and missions, um, one of the areas that we really focused on was how do we pull this together and what's our unifying principle? And for us, there are a couple things uh, that we've now made as, as pretty significant shifts that are allowing us uh, every day to evaluate how we produce better intelligence as well as be able to now deliver new outcomes in the information environment. And, and the, one of the key themes of that is that we're problem centric. Whereas in the past, we were very focused on every individual ISR sortie, being able to evaluate how many hours we did, how many products were produced. It's now really about what problems need to get solved. And putting airmen on hard problems is just a fantastic opportunity for innovation. But having that problem-centric approach, which are the hardest problems that we need to address in any of our roles, how we integrate the, the relevant access to data that is, that, that is result of all the missions and authorities and responsibilities we have assigned, and then how we partner with all of the various combatant commands, air components, and the interagency now creates an opportunity to produce new outcomes. And we've organized ourselves across three lines of effort, which are how do we generate insights is our first line of effort. Foundational to all conflict is understanding our adversary. And, and we are really well postured with an ISR enterprise uh, that every day is focused on our adversaries through the lens of many combatant commanders, as well as the authorities and missions that are assigned to our airmen uh, through the National Security Agency. We have really great insights and opportunity to understand what our adversaries are doing, both in the information environment, as well as in, in, in other domains. The second line of effort has been focused on competing now. One of the things that the National Defense Strategy clearly articulated is there's a conflict continuum that starts in competition, extends through escalation, and then conflict. What we really are is we're, we have the opportunity in 16th Air Force to be that competition force that the Air Force presents. And how do we every day is our understanding of the environment that's occurring, where do we see adversary activities that we should then be considering and partnering with others to expose, as well as to be able to put pressure on our adversaries uh, with a number of series of partners that, that now contest them in this competition phase. Um, but ultimately, we have to be prepared for our third line of effort, which is escalation. If our nation needs us to be able to be prepared for conflict with an adversary, We've got to be prepared to do so in the cyber domain. We will be expected to produce outcomes, but enabling outcomes in all the other domains through our ISR enterprise, through our targeting, and through our partnerships. And, and that scope and scale gives us a lot of opportunity, but it also allows us, I, I think, to put our airmen in a position to be thought leaders in how our service is considering this. And, and I think they've recognized well ahead of, of the national defense strategy and how we've approached this is, uh, we've been in competition with our adversaries for some time, and, and we have to identify within our own service where are areas that we've built in biases that, that are inhibiting our ability to integrate and be able to put pressure on our adversaries that are doing things either uh, that are against our uh, nation, against our values, against our democracy, as well as against our allies. And, and, and I'll give you just an example of, of things that, that, that we're thinking about which are in many respects in our Air Force, we, we have trained ourselves through a series of tactical exercises which are absolutely necessary for us to be able to perform activities in conflict. But it also establishes for us a set of parameters that fights on when we actually have aircraft engaged in the battle space. 
when in reality, we're engaged in the information environment every single day, and we have been for some time. Was, did conflict really begin when the DNC was hacked? Was that really the first day of conflict and really engage in competition that we recognized? Or was it the first time that there was intellectual property theft from China in 2012? Is that really when we entered into the competition phase, but we didn't join that battlefield uh, in terms of all the things that we would have been able to do on behalf of our nation to be able to, to make that more difficult uh, for our adversaries to be able to continue to advance their interests uh, while also impacting ours. Those are things that we're asking our airmen to think through and come back with. What are the options that we should be working with air components and combatant commands to make it more difficult every day? And we see some great opportunities in terms of our airmen that have been focused on decision advantage uh, and being able to provide intelligence to combatant commanders and air components uh, all the way down to company commanders on the battlefield to make good decisions. We're now asking those same airmen, how can you produce an outcome today by exposing what an adversary is doing and, and putting that in the information environment? And, I can, and we can talk more through specific examples of whether that's how we're approaching defense of the elections, which is a high priority for the Department of Defense, and how that transition is really an example of now what it means to be in competition in, in terms of the assignment of the Department of Defense to be a part of the defense of our electoral process is not something we would have considered uh, really five years ago. But now it's a core mission of the Department of Defense and, and we are all aligned in support of DHS and FBI to ensure we have a successful and safe uh, election. So we can talk more about any of those, uh, those areas. Uh, for us, the other thing that, that we're also really excited about is how uh, the role that 16th Air Force and our airmen uh, are, are in terms of transforming how our networks are, are, are operating and the services that we've got available. Um, our airmen are, have done some just absolutely amazing things uh, in terms of how we've responded to COVID. And on uh, March 10th, we had the ability to support 9,000 uh, airmen on any given day for telework. That was our demand signal that we had received from our Air Force. On March 12th, the demand signal was 300,000 airmen uh, needed to telework. And, and our airmen, in partnership with Air Combat Command, with uh, Air, Air Force LCMC, as well as our CIO's office and their staff, uh, were able to respond really quickly and, and be able to present to our, our Air Force a series of telework capabilities that now we're really comfortable and, and have now hit a really solid rhythm of being able to leverage airmen regardless of whether in the workplace or whether at home, uh, being able to fully leverage the talents of our airmen. And we could talk more about that or how uh, we've, we've had to adjust in relation to unique circumstances from each of our airmen, but really proud of how we've, we've been able to transform from a telework perspective and also how all of our operational units have been able to sustain operational capacity in an environment where we're certainly also being very conscious of health of our force and also the unique circumstances that every family is dealing with, whether that be schools, childcare, all those other issues. We're really proud of how our airmen have responded to that. So that's, our, that, that's really the overview from my perspective in terms of our roles and missions. I'd like to turn over to Chief uh, for her thoughts um, in terms of where we're starting at 16th Air Force. Thank you, sir, and, and thank you for the invitation and opportunity to join you today. This is such an important event, and I'm honored to be a part of it and to represent the 16th Air Force. One of the things I want to give a shout out to is all of the brave women and men who have gone before us that helped us get to where we are today. We have this incredible legacy and heritage, and that is the foundation that we stand on. We stand on the shoulders of giants, and I appreciate that so much. And in honor of that, in honor of that legacy, we're moving forward with the same type of energy and commitment and passion um, to achieving outcomes and delivering outcomes for our nation. Uh, one of the ways that we do that is through our enlisted force. I am proud to say in the 16th Air Force, the majority of our operators are enlisted airmen and they are wicked smart tackling wicked problems. As the boss said, uh, we are becoming and have been and are showing up as thought leaders within our Air Force across a number of different things. So from our operations to how we develop our force, how we move forward as an organization, the things that we're doing with our Listen, Learn, Lead initiative, which I hope we have time to come back to later. We are finding a way, making the way, and showing the way. 
And that's how the Phoenix of the 16th Air Force show up. Over, sir. Thank, thanks, Chief. So, so uh, uh, General Ray, what I'd like to talk a little bit now is, is kind of build on what Chief just said in terms of that I think all of us as a nation are, are dealing with. So since the killing uh, uh, of George Floyd, um, it, it has really uh, had an impact on our nation and, and every one of our airmen. And, and, and I think what we've been really proud of is how our airmen have responded to that um, and, and really acknowledging that there are, there are a number of open wounds in our nation and, and we wanted to be, uh, give our airmen the opportunity to really teach us as to what some of those underlying issues were, how they were affecting them, and then how we could respond. And where, where we've spent some significant time is, is really with our airmen and creating forums so we could learn from them. And, and I think personally, I, I can't thank them enough because it certainly as for, for me, I, I've certainly been able to recognize blind spots that I've had that I didn't recognize in terms of whether or not there was uh, unconscious bias that we were as an organization uh, perpetuating, whether things we could inform in our institution, our great institution of the United States Air Force, how we can continue to improve our Air Force, as well as where are things we can do to influence within our society uh, that ensures dignity and respect for our airmen. And, and I think we'll, I, what I'd like to do is just take a couple minutes and, and, and have Chief and I give you a little bit of perspective on, on what we have learned so far. But what, what we wanted to do initially was create a forum um, where we could allow our airmen to express what they're feeling and also what they've experienced. And, and we did that through creation of groups that we called Listen, Learn, Lead forums. And the idea being the first phase of this is for all of us as leaders at every level, all the way down to the first line supervisor, to be able to listen to what our airmen have experienced both in service and in our nation. And then uh, as, we, as we listen, learn from that so that we can lead and create out outcomes and actions. And, and so we, we're, we're proud of the forums. We've learned a lot. Um, and, and I'd like to pass it to Chief for her perspective and, and thus far. Thank you, sir. So one of the things that we learned is we have a lot of work to do. Um, and there are airmen who have felt that they have not been fully empowered, that they have been diminished in some way because they're not able to, they're not encouraged to, and they're definitely not celebrated for showing up fully as themselves. While being, you know, of course we want every airman to be true to our core values, absolutely. We also want every airman to show up fully and completely as themselves because that's what we need. That's, that is our power. The power in air power, is our people. The strength of our force is the strength of each of one of our individuals. And as we listen to these stories and people were so brave and had so much courage to one, share their stories and then to listen without the immediate need to respond, rather they listen to absorb and process and think about it and consider different perspectives. We heard stories how airmen can be in their uniform and treated one way, yet they go off base and they're out of uniform and be treated completely differently, right? The, uh, the discrimination that they have to face, yet they, they have stepped up, them and their families, to serve our country. And some of the airmen even told stories how they go into one location with their uniform and how they're treated versus when they go into the same location, not in their uniform. This is unacceptable. And we are taking action. So as we learned these things, we did look at action. That was one of the things that we learned. Airmen, this is not the first time they've had this conversation, many of them. And they've been trying to get people to listen, learn, and then act for a very long time. So I applaud and I'm so grateful that they had the courage and the commitment to stick with us as we are demonstrating to them that we are acting. We're taking tangible actions and not just listening without any intent to do anything about it. So we have a um, solid plan of actions that are solidly within our control and influence right now. Some things are, are things that we can change very easily, small fixes, and then things that we're going to do to work with our communities and community engagement and then with our higher headquarters to address policies that may no longer and maybe never ever did really serve us as um, an organization moving forward. 
Yeah, thanks, Chief. The, the area in there that, that I thought was that, that I'm really, uh, gives me a lot of optimism. One is that our airmen really have persevered with us. And there's an analogy as, as we started to look at this, as Chief talked about the barriers, like if we did a red team test on our networks and we found a vulnerability, we would close that vulnerability. We've now exposed a number of areas which are barriers to our airmen that we want to close. And, and that's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot of work across our service. And I'm, I'm really proud of, of the work that's happening in Air Force A1 uh, in the diversity, diversity and inclusion task force. The fact that our secretary is the lead for the department um, and being able to then represent some of the ideas. So, so we've, we've just tried to, in some cases, be a conduit for the ideas our airmen have identified to be able to get that to our Air Force with Air Combat Command. And we're getting a lot of support, I think, from uh, the, the DNI task force. But then also, as we engage with uh, various bases where we're hosted, is we're also seeing a willingness within the community to have a dialogue. It is not something I had ever considered in my career that we should be uh, in thinking about what are the engagements between our airmen and the local police force? And how do we give feedback to our local communities if we don't have a positive engagement? Or if we do have a positive engagement, how do we reinforce that? And, and those are things that we have as an Air Force, as, as a really large community partner, how do we use that to also inform our local teammates who, in San Antonio, they're fantastic. We have great partnerships and they are certainly wor working uh, with us on every issue. How do we do that at every location where we as 16th Air Force are the, the, either the host or we bring a really large substantial population to that local community, there's certainly opportunities for us to set standards and expectations of how our airmen are treated both in the installation and off the installation that, that is commensurate with our nation's values and our Air Force Corps values. And we're gonna to continue to work through those um, all the way from the very simple things where we've identified in, in some of our terminology and language uh, that, that are things that I could not have recognized through my uh, own filter that airmen have identified that is, has been routine, whether that's an ISR or communications or an IT language, that we can now go back and ensure that we're treating every airman with dignity and respect. To how do we advocate for changes to our, um, our, our dress and appearance instructions if there are things that are clearly only really uh, impacting a small portion of our population, how would we evaluate those? And, and those have been really well received from our Air Force. Um, we also, uh, as a court martial convening authority, we are closely tracking the work that the Air Force is doing in relation to ensuring uh, there's, that, that we are fair and equitable to all airmen as part of our military justice process. And, and we are working internally to 16th Air Force to ensure that we understand uh, across all the way from our first line supervisor, how we initiate discipline to myself as a court martial convening authority, how do, what are our standards? How do we communicate and how do we ensure fairness and equity um, as, as we go forward? And I've been really proud of our military justice team in the work that they've done to be able to, to help us do analysis and support all the commanders at, at every level. So there's a lot of work left to be done there, um, but we're really proud of our airmen. Uh, Chief, any closing thoughts uh, on, on that topic? So I'll reiterate, um, the, the power in air power is our people. The strength of any one individual determines our collective strength. When we diminish any one airman, we are all diminished. We must lift up every airman so we may rise up together. And that's what we're committed to in the 16th Air Force. It's going to take courage and curiosity and compassion, and it's gonna take us pulling together. And that's what we've been doing, and I know that's where we're moving forward in the future. Thanks, Chief. And, and right aligned with that, you know, one of the areas that, 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 that we wanted to make sure we talked about today was, was also how we, we recruit, retain, and develop airmen. And, and that, that clearly the environment that we create is one of those key areas of, of how we treat airmen every single day with dignity and respect and allow them to reach their full potential certainly has an impact on us every day from a retention standpoint and a development standpoint. 
Um, for us, as, as the, the lead for Air Force Information Warfare, we've got a great partnership with our teammates at, at uh, Headquarters Air Force that are in the A26 that, that are the functional management responsibilities for information warfare and setting the policy and guidance for the, for the developmental category. We're transforming our Air Force does uh, many of, of the developmental activities and how our development teams look and how we promote airmen. Uh, we've made a lot of changes over the last few years. It gives us a lot of opportunity space, I think also in terms of how we develop our force. We've, we've done a number of things all the way back to uh, basic training to also improve the airmen experience when they arrive at their first unit. And, and uh, General Bryan started this when, when she was uh, the ISR NAF commander, which was to partner with the recruiting service to be able to start airmen's clearances before and have them complete before they leave BNT. And we're now at a spot where our airmen are at 99% of approved adjudicated clearances before they arrive at their first operational unit, which is fantastic. We don't want them sitting outside waiting for a clearance. We want them being able to use the skills we've, we've applied to them uh, at their technical training and getting them to work as fast as we can. So that's been one area of major improvement. We are also working with General Thomas, uh, the new recruiting service commander, to take full advantage of all of the things that Congress is also giving us. There, there are areas where Congress has given us a lot of latitude in terms of, of how we recruit our civilian airmen, particularly within the cyber domain, and then also, how do we help spot the right talent for our various um, career fields where our enlisted airmen are really the key to our nation and to be able to produce outcomes in, in terms of really uh, highly technical intelligence or, or cyber related activities. And, and I think we're excited about that partnership with the recruiting service. We've seen great promise and we've done really well at training our airmen and getting them certified. Uh, we, want, we want to continue to work really closely uh, with all of our team on, on the ability to retain those airmen. Last area, I think now that we're looking at it from an information warfare perspective, is we have really been emphasizing as a service the technical aspects and being able to ensure we've got STEM recruits. And, and now we're also now asking ourselves, what is the, the ensuring the balance for our cultural understanding? In terms of, if we look at the national defense strategy and, and China and Russia, um, we, we clearly also need to be able to ensure that we've really got a deep understanding and growing the airmen that are focused on understanding the nuances of culture and language in a way that allows us to inform uh, potential outcomes if asked to do so. Chief, any thoughts on, on recruiting retention uh, for our airmen? So one of the things I want to share is that we have an opportunity here where um, Airmen can really fulfill a sense of purpose by joining our team, by being part of our mission set. They're going to see immediate uh, national level, sometimes global level results of the work that they do. And that's not something that they're going to necessarily have the opportunity to do out in the private sector. So we're looking for those individuals who have the skills and the aptitude and the desire and willingness to do what their nation needs them to do, to keep our entire nation and our families safe. And I also want to point out that this is a shift for our entire Department of Defense. When I review the National Defense Strategy, there's only a couple lines in there that talk about the cognitive domain, cognitive warfare, what we're doing to um, contribute to the growth of um, cognition within the Department of Defense. I believe more and more this is going to become important for our Department of Defense across all of our different skill sets, the, the operations that we have, that we invest in the cognitive domain so that every service member, regardless of what job they're doing, what task they're assigned, understands the importance of information warfare, how to counter disinformation, how to apply critical thinking skills, and develop the sword of their mind. Over. Thanks, Chief. Uh, General Wright, I think we're over to you uh, for, for any questions. Well, first, uh, thanks so much. Uh, incredible insight uh, that helped, I think, all of us team with you and understand and certainly applaud for your leadership and incredible work you're doing. Uh, I'd be remiss, by the way, as uh, you brought up um, the uh, contributions of our civilian workforce, uh, to not thank one of your uh, senior civilians that uh, 
Security Hill 62 Forces Body Plant. We define airmen to include uh, civilians, uh, officer, and enlisted airmen. So please pass along our thanks to Body for her leadership and her service over the years. Many of us that have worked there, and I know you can, and some of us can't thank Body enough. An exemplar for all of us. Well, with that, we're now going to open the session to questions from the audience. And as we've been listening to this terrific conversation, and as a reminder to our listeners, you can participate in the question and answer period by using the raise the hand function on your device. Uh, when I call on you, uh, please unmute your mic and state your name and affiliation uh, for our guests here before asking the question. Questions. You can also submit a question in writing using the Q&A function. In that case, I'll just read the question aloud to Lieutenant General Hawk and Chief Master Sergeant Leiper. And with that, uh, let's first go uh, for a question to our Rachel Cohen at uh, Air Force Magazine. Rachel. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for doing this. So I'm, I'm curious at this point in the year, um, you know, you guys are kind of waiting for Congress to uh, agree or not with the Air Force's decision to retire um, a bunch of global hawks. So I'm curious from, from the numbered Air Force perspective, what are you doing to prepare for the possibility that they, uh, that those global hawks might be going away um, in, the, in the near future? Um, you know, what does that mean for personnel or for ops and, and backfilling that, you know, kind of where do you stand right now? Uh, thanks, thanks, Rachel. Uh, great question. I, I think from our perspective, this is where uh, we do have the joy of being the operator in that our job every day is, is to be able to, to maximize everything that we could possibly do for an air component or a combatant commander every day with the resources we've been given. And so that's really where the, our team that is operating Global Hawk, I received an update yesterday on another innovation as they've been working on because they're gonna continue to optimize everything we're doing with the Global Hawk uh, for as long as that, the, the Global Hawk's in our inventory. And, and the, the area that we're trying to inform in our service that just to allow our service to, to be able to evaluate is as we look at the conflict continuum, what are the ISR resources we need in competition? What are ISR resources do we need in escalation? What do we need in conflict? And, and what is that mix of resources as we go forward in terms of blending uh, what the Air Force presents, the, the authorities we leverage with the, with the intelligence community? So, so I think from our standpoint today, um, we, we are certainly, uh, all of our Air Force ISR is in high demand from the combatant commanders. Uh, and I think there will be a number of choices that are gonna have to be made across uh, the department in terms of how we invest in competition versus conflict. And, and, I, and we wanna just continue to inform that. But as long as uh, there's any uh, bit of kit or authority with, that we've been given, we're gonna continue to optimize it for everything that we can. Over. What, what's the thing that you were briefed on? Uh, so, so for us every day, uh, what I was looked at right now, which is in terms of how to optimize each sortie, um, I, I probably am not going to go into really any operational details to which AOR, um, but we work really closely uh, with Air Combat Command and each of the COCOM J2s and J3s, and, and we do ensure that we're periodically assessing the effectiveness. And so we found a way uh, to ensure that we're increasing from a maintenance perspective uh, that we knew now where we were able to be a little bit more predictive in terms of a particular sensor to ensure that we were optimizing that for every sortie. Uh, but what we're proud of the airmen of the 319th that they continue to really produce outcomes uh, every day across multiple AORs. Thank you. Okay, we've got a number of good questions here and I'll start uh, with Ken Wick. Um, and again, express uh, his appreciation for being uh, with you all today and, and thank you for your leadership. The question is this, as I think we all know, agility is a challenge in the DOD at large from development to acquisition to fielding. Certainly we're making progress, but our adversaries from individuals to nation states do not appear to have the same legacy culture and barriers to agility and using the latest technology. What are your thoughts on 16th Air Force's uh, engagement, uh, in mission, uh, and uh, for the larger Air Force, and how we best make progress and to move, to move faster and be more agile in the, in the cyber domain. So these are great questions, and and, and the at, at its at its core, we have to build on our strengths, and our strengths are our values, and 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 for us as the Department of Defense, that means focusing on truth and being able to expose truth. 
And, and that is a very powerful elixir in the information environment. Being able to expose activities for what they are, whether that's us exposing them, enabling a mission partner in the US government to expose them, enabling a foreign partner, um, that those are all within the opportunity space for us uh, in terms of the roles and missions we've been assigned. Uh, the normal response I get from that is, uh, is uh, I'll now get, I'll answer the next question before it's asked, which is, okay, you've put truth out there and Russia just tells another lie. How does that help you? And the answer is, from my perspective, the more we can put truth as to what their activities are, just like what AFRICOM recently did in exposing the linkage between a private military company and the Russian Ministry of Defense and how they've moved aircraft into Libya, that was exposed by AFRICOM, that's not truth. Russia has to respond to that. But it not only does Russia's response matter, but now the international environment is now informed by the fact that that truth is out there and can be discussed in every embassy, it can be discussed with each of our allies, and we can expose what the adversary is doing. And that becomes the seed corn of those dialogues. The more that we can expose adversaries' malign activity in the competition space enables the Department of State to act, it enables Treasury, it enables our foreign partners to have a much better sight picture on what threat looks like. And those are areas for us that have to be foundational. And the more comfort we get with exposing that malign activity um, allows that dialogue to go faster and become more coherent in the international environment. I think we're seeing it in General Raymond's approach, the fact that he has been very aggressive in, in communicating what is occurring in space and what those threats look like and declassifying things to ensure that now there can be an environment where those can be very clear discussions at an unclassified level between governments as to what that threat is also allows now many other options within the executive branch tool, toolkit, as well as partnerships with other nations to be able to then build on that. That's where we have to start. It's got to be always built on that the Department of Defense, we were going to communicate in facts, consistent with our values, consistent with our policies, consistent with our laws, but that becomes an enabler in the information environment um, as we go forward. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jim. Great, great question, terrific response. Uh, from Kenneth Bruce, uh, this is for Chief Wiper, I think, to start. How do we improve recruiting and front-end education for minority airmen, especially black airmen? The current numbers uh, reflect about 12.8% in the 1N community and 9% in the 1B community. Chief Wiper. So thanks for that question, Kenny. It's good to hear from you, brother. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to know that you're out there and you're doing amazing things for our Air Force and our world. So big hearts for that. Um, part of, and General Hawk touched on this earlier, we recently uh, worked with the Air Force Recruiting Service to get after initi initiatives. So there's a couple things. Um, making sure that we have outreach in communities, right? So sometimes people don't even know what an option is for them. Also finding airmen to be ambassadors for us. So sometimes, you know, it's hard for people to believe they can be something if they cannot see it. So finding those airmen that can serve as um, examples and connect with communities, draw those folks in. Likewise, we are working with AFPC to see how we can perhaps embed some airmen there to, to talk, look at their policies and what we could do from that angle as we work with the Air Force Recruiting Service. Uh, we've looked at um, doing uh, six months or so rotations. This is all <laughs> pre-decisional, so um, just so you know, these are in discussions of where we take airmen that are, have been working uh, cyber missions and have experience with that, and then they go work with the recruiting service to go out into the communities um, and help us at least provide more opportunities for people to have touch points and communication so we can draw all that talent in. There is so much untapped potential and talent out there that is just waiting for us to make the effort. Um, and that is a wonderful question. Thank you so much. Great, thanks, Chief. We've got a hand up from Sarah Serrata. Uh, Sarah, can uh, you unmute your mic and uh, again, yep. your background? And can you hear me? I can. All right, great. Thank you very much for doing this. Uh, General Hawk, I'm wondering if you can talk about the relationship between the 16th Air Force and the Advanced Battle Management System Chief Architect Office and how 
the two uh, organizations may be informing one another and whether or not you think that the BMS team needs to think about investing in uh, a next gen C2 ISR platform to demonstrate all the technologies that that they're working on there. Thank you. Uh, so we're, we're, we're uh, thrilled to be partnered with the with the team in, that that was really the AFWIC leads for building out where we're going for JAD C2 and, and ABMS. Um, we, we've got a number of touch points with them, and and I'll kind of walk through them in in, in a, a couple of different ways. One is really as the 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 operator of the Air Force networks, um, we certainly have a, a really tight role with how we think about uh, the ability to, to inform and move data at both in peacetime and in wartime. And that's, that's an area that we're closely partnering. As we go forward with our enterprises as service risk reduction activities, that's also nested inside this discussion, which is how do we build out our compute and store locally so that we're more prepared uh, for ABMS, JADC2 types of, of activities as we go forward. We're also partnered in the number of, of experiments that continue to, to go on uh, across our Air Force. We've, we've been involved in, in each one of those in various ways. But the other area that, that we see is, is a really close partnership is how do we take the data we have in our Air Force to be able to inform and rapidly return an understanding in the environment uh, is, is one of the really key components of ABMS. So we're excited to both be an enabler of ABMS on the network side and a customer in terms of to be able to move data and then be able to leverage some of our other authorities to add some of the IC flavor to that in some areas that'll be unique to us. So we see a great partnership uh, with them. We want to continue to experiment uh, via, the, via the Warfare Center and the things that are coming. And we see some areas where we can actually bring our unique authorities and access to data to continue to be an area that would be an enhancement uh, for ABMS. So we think it's a strong partnership. We're excited about the path that they're on. And, and we definitely see a number of touch points uh, between 16th Air Force and, and how that will evolve over time. Over. Thanks, Tim. And to wind up, I'm gonna roll a couple of questions together from uh, Frank Lawrence and Neil Allen. that go along the lines of uh, direct 16th Air Force's direct interaction with large or small tech companies uh, that do not necessarily or have not had military, traditional military associations. Um, as you quickly update systems and respond to the threat. Uh, so those are, those are great questions. I'll answer it a couple different ways. So it depends on our role and, and which mission we're performing. In, in terms of, of the things that, that are organized and trained and equipped by our Air Force, we're really reliant on Air Combat Command to be that conduit. In, in terms of being the operational force for all the roles and missions we're executing, um, we're, we've been really reliant on Air Combat Command to be the, the inject point of the new technology. And they have been an awesome partner. I think we have seen it, and, and just as one example would be the things that we've done in telework and how we're advancing with Cyber Command, with DISA, and with the DOD CIO, has been injected by the ACCA-6 and we're in support of them. And it's really been a great partnership. We're seeing the same types of things uh, also in how we engage with AFWorks and things that are going on with our LCMC partners. We're really using, they're, they're our conduit for that. On the cyber side, we have a direct relationship with US Cyber Command as a component. And we've got a really a, a neat partnership with a number of universities as well as uh, creating forums. Uh, Cyber Command has created a forum called Dreamport, which is an area where uh, it's an unclassified environment where uh, vendors can be brought in, whether they're brought in from DIUX or any other element to be able to experiment with technologies and have some access to data uh, that Cyber Command can provide and allow all of the components to participate in. We've seen uh, really some benefit for that in that forum has really helped us with our big data platforms and some of the analysis that we're doing on the cybersecurity side. So I think it's very different depending on which uh, mission we're talking about, uh, whether we have direct involvement or indirect through our, through our partners. Uh, but, but we're excited with where ACC has taken this for a number of our missions uh, going forward. For everyone on the net though today, thank you so much for being part of the Air Force Association team here, uh, for joining the fight. Uh, this event will be recorded and uh, put on our website shortly uh, for continued review. 
And again, for General Hawk and for Chief Wiper, gosh, I'll, I'll follow you anywhere. Just uh, where, where's the target and uh, tell us what time to be there. Uh, you're both just, just inspirational. We can't thank you enough.